Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Fourth and Gold right here at Beyond the Big Ten. We are Beyond the Big Ten, giving you coverage for all your college football all season long and going beyond the game. Follow us at Beyond the Big Ten. My name is Joey Christopoulos. Let's bring in our host for the day. He is former Minnesota Gophers standout, also former NFL player. Brock Vereen. What's up, Brock? What is going on? It's always a better morning after a uh, go for victory. So rolling high, rowing the boat, and uh, the Big Ten West is still in play. You called it weeks ago, Brock, and here we are. We are in the chaos. We are in the eye of the hurricane of the Big Ten West chaos that's going on right now. But let's first, let's recap. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the Minnesota Gophers picking up a victory 27-12 to over Michigan State. Uh, Brock, your first blush thoughts on the game because, honestly, you look at the final score, you got home, and you go, ah, easy does it. But, honestly, it, did, <laughs> it didn't quite play that out, right? Collars, collars were a little tight for, uh, for Minnesota Gophers fans in the first half. Certainly. And the state of the team is what it is, kind of finding a place of stasis. But I, I feel anyone who's watched the team throughout the year, you're still a little uncertain which team you're going to get each and every Saturday. And early on with that game, with two two critical turnovers really to start the game off, it was, oh boy, this is going to be one of those games right now. Obviously, like you mentioned, the the final score dictates that they did get things under control. The offense had a very slow start. The defense, to their credit, really held it down. Despite great field position from Michigan State uh, early on in the game, the defense was able to hold them to some field goals so that when Minnesota, Minnesota's offense really got going, really in the second quarter and especially the second half, uh, there was, you know, collars weren't tight, as you said, because the uh, the, the uh, defense held, held firm. You're at this point of the season where officially now, I believe, we're in the the final third of the year there's not many drastic leaps in improvement from here on out yeah. you, you know you're kind of who you are at this point um and this is what minnesota is going to be right when the offense can play mistake free when when nathan can can make smart decisions with the football you're always going to have a chance if the defense who has now put together back-to-back -back performances um worthy of a win if they can keep that going, then they can win games. But it, of course, starts with the mistakes of the offense. I think that's a great point, too, especially at this point in the season. You know, in college football, sometimes we want to talk about style points, especially when we talk about, you know, like the top 25 and everything like that. But if you're Minnesota right now and if you're in the Big Ten West, this is all about TCB. Take care of business, win football games, keep moving forward, and keep stacking them up as you move along. So let's talk about taking care of business. Um, Let's not bury the headline here. Uh, there was one player who showed up big time. I mean, there was a couple of highlights for sure from this <laughs> Minnesota Gophers team. But, you know, I want to talk to you about Jordan Newbin. I just got it right here. 40 carries, 204 yards, 5.1 a pop, two touchdowns. Reading up on this guy, Brock, I'm loving him more every single second. Um, you watch him play and you hear about a little bit about his story. So just for Gophers fans who may be – are asking themselves a little bit, who is Jordan Newbin right now? I didn't really see him on the depth chart at the beginning of the year. Um, who is Jordan Newbin, and how big of a factor was he to pick up this win? Sure. Jordan Newbin. Uh, so I, I, I cover Minnesota spring game for the Big Ten Network, and that is, of course, my introduction into each year's team. And obviously, the last name is familiar, the younger brother of Tyler Newbin. And whenever you see the 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 younger brother of one of the stars of the team, it's always, okay, is this guy here because they wanted to keep their star happy or is he here on, on his own merit? There's always a little side eye there. Uh, but what you first noticed in spring was, okay, this running back room is loaded with dudes. And then it was, yeah, all these dudes can go. Like Every single one of these guys, if given the opportunity, can go now to start the season. Jordan Newbin, of course, was buried pretty deep on that depth chart. Did anybody expect he'd have 40 carries in, in, in total for this year? Absolutely not. But you have Darius Taylor, who came back last week against Iowa, was not available this game. You have Zach Evans, who really stood up when when Darius Taylor was out for that for, for those couple weeks midseason and then left the game against Iowa as well. So you enter this game, and you have two guys, because Bryce Williams, another running back, really their third down guy, was also out with injury for the year just a couple of weeks ago, before Iowa. So you enter this game with Sean Tyler, who entered the year as running back one. He was the Western Michigan transfer, fifth or sixth year guy, super experienced. 
had the bulk of the carries um, for the first couple weeks against Eastern Michigan, ha- puts the ball on the ground three times, I believe, and may- maybe the fourth one rolled out of bounds, so that one didn't count. Um, had to sit down for a little bit. <laughs> And then you have a lot of injuries, and the very first couple of plays, Sean Tyler was back in there because they were banged up, and it was okay. You 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 have our trust because you initially were our starter, but the issue was holding on to the ball, and I believe his second carry of the game, uh, the ball goes on the ground. P.J. Fleck had had enough, and the, the trust was gone. So enter Jordan Newbin, the guy who no one expected him to have 40 carries at all this season and here he puts that team on his back that offense on his back um daniel jackson was able to have another big game but by all means uh if jordan newbin is not able to be thrust into the fire there i don't even know who the running back after him is hand hand up have no clue who would have gone in if something happened to jordan newbin he knew the stakes and he rose to the occasion uh that's what they were saying after the game i mean when you bring in i guess it's fair to say your fifth maybe fifth string tailback um, into the game. And he only, you know, and he picks up the yards and he gets it done, right? I mean, it wasn't anything too fancy. I think the long that he had was maybe 19 yards. But I was also reading that last year um, he was listed as a safety on the team. Um, And he's a converted, he's converted over to the offense. So when you see that guy running between the tackles, I mean, he had some really nice hard runs. He was dragging guys with him along, really kind of setting the tone for the team. And for him to step up and come in, get 200 yards, Brock, um, what a ga- what a <laughs> galvanizing insane. effort, and it kind of leads me to my uh, just a quick little side question for you. I mean, you know, you played on the defensive side of the ball. Um, did you ever like it, w- if you had a dream, right, to put you on the offensive side? Are you spinning it? Are you are you toting the rock? Or are you running out? Or are you catching passes? Like if they said, Brock, we need you, man. You're our six seventh string guy. You know, on offense, what <laughs> what would that have been for you? It's so funny because two years ago, Derek LeCaptain. Uh, after a bevy of injuries to the Minnesota running back room, they were so depleted that their reserve linebacker had to take carries, and he actually scored against Northwestern, if I'm not mistaken. So I was a running back. Going back to Pop Warner football, I was running back because my older brother was, and my dad played receiver, so I, I, I initially was drawn to the offensive side of the ball. There wasn't a specific moment, but at some point in high school, now, now you know, like most Pop Warner kids, you're, if you're the fastest guy out there, you don't leave the field. So I, I did play defense also, um, but I, I loved offense. At some point in high school, it just clicked for me. Freshman year, I'll, actually, you know, I'll, I'll say sophomore year. Sophomore year, I remember thinking, I, I just want to play defense. I, I don't like offense at all. I kept playing it throughout high school. But most of my opportunities to play in college were – um, on the defensive side of the ball, there were two that liked me offensively. I hated offense. Really? Hated it. So if I had to pick one, I despised it. So if I had to pick one, slot receiver was more fun than running back for me. I hated playing wide out. I liked slot because I just wanted the ball as quickly as possible. Sure. Um, because at that point, it just kind of turns into a kickoff return or a punt return. Um, but yeah, short, lo- a, a, a long answer short. Hated offense. If I had to pick one, I'd play slot. Wow, that's one of the more authentic answers you're ever going to hear. That is an against-the-grain <laughs> Monday take right now uh, because I think most people, of course, they, everyone gravitates towards the offensive side of the ball. Everyone wants to spike it after you get to pay dirt and everything like that. But And maybe I was just assuming you always just wanted to tackle your brother growing up, which has made you want to be on the, on the defensive <laughs> I'm side. I'm sure that was ball. part of it, too. Um, that's really awesome. I, I do also want to flip over. I mean, we would be remiss to not talk about the offensive effort of Daniel Jackson in the last two weeks. Um, this is a guy with 14 receptions now over the last two games. I believe he's got 221 yards. He got a score in this last game. I mean, that touchdown was pretty huge, right? Because, I mean, I think the offense, we were seeing that stagnation from the gopher offense at that point. Getting in the end zone with Daniel Jackson was huge. I want to talk about, you know, a little bit about, like, what you're seeing from his game that's kind of really risen to the surface over the last couple of weeks. But I also want to talk a little bit about, like, how can we kind of fabrically influx this with Kalik Manis a little bit? Now, we've got him going a little bit with Daniel Jackson. Does having a go-to receiver kind of help him a little bit, gain a little bit more confidence as we move along here deeper into the season? Because we've got big games coming up still to win. It definitely comes – it brings a sense of comfort, right? Week one, um, that Thursday night game, all eyes on Minnesota and Nebraska. Daniel Jackson, of course, has the catch of the week with that 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 toe drag uh, to win the game. 
and then it was kind of nothing. And a lot of that was Minnesota wanting to establish the run week after week after week, running the ball 50-something times, whatever it was against, against Eastern Michigan. And, of course, the, the struggles of Cali Manis. Those struggles are still there. There's still some head-scratching turnovers like we saw um, against Michigan State. There's some interceptions like against Michigan. Where are you throwing the ball? Uh, but he's growing, and he will figure it out. It's just that, you know what? Maybe the growth we were expecting this year won't come until next year. That's fine if you have a guy like Daniel Jackson who's been around forever, seen a ton of football, and just knows how to get open and – the lack of completions hasn't been because he hasn't been open. It's been because the offensive line has had some some iffy weeks and, of course, the growth of Kaliak Manis. So Daniel Jackson, back-to-back 100-yard games, uh, back-to-back games with touchdowns. The offense kind of goes in this similar rhythm so far in the past two weeks. It's let's come out, let's establish that we can pass the ball so that teams can't load the box. Sometimes there's turnovers. A lot of times there's early incompletions. Then Minnesota goes to the run. And then eventually the run just kind of stalls out. And back-to-back weeks, Daniel Jackson has been able to keep defenses honest, especially early second half or, or, or late, late late second quarter, too, um, and make big plays downfield. One, to keep defenses on, honest. Two, to go into halftime with a little bit of confidence um, for Ethan and for the rest of the team. He has been out of this world, man, out of this world. Uh, just maybe some final thoughts on the game before we get to the bigger, broader picture of the Big Ten West and, and, and the Big Ten in general. Um, you know, I just want to give you one more uh, opportunity. Any more final thoughts on the defense specifically? Um, you know, look, Michigan State, it's been a tough season for them. But anytime you hold an opponent to 12 points, uh, that strip sack in the second half really kind of started putting the nail in the coffin a little bit. Any final thoughts on the defense? And just moving forward, um, any areas that you've, you've seen improve over the last couple of weeks that you want to see turn into consistent habits? The linebacker room is is, is going to be interesting. Mm. Uh, linebacker Ryan Seelig, who was really the third linebacker on the roster, um, he was he, he got banged up in that game. Now, what we did see was the return of Cody Lindenberg. Well, really not the return because uh, we haven't seen him at all this year. He he got debut a, a, a significant <laughs> hamstring. Yeah, the debut. There you go. Yeah. He, he had a significant hamstring injury in training camp, and as PJ Fleck does, you know. It, Every week he's questionable, questionable, because, you know, you don't want, want anyone to know anything that they don't have to know. Yeah. And personally, I I assumed, okay, there's only a third of the year left. At most, we'll just see him for the last four games just to keep his red shirt or something. But he was out there, and he actually did make a significant impact for a guy who, who hadn't played football all year long. Now, why I say it gets interesting, because... Mavic Baranowski, the freshman who has played tremendously outside of Tyler Noob, and I'll say he's the second best. He's played as the second best player on that defense all year long, has been awesome. So Mavic started, Cody Lindenberg rotated with him. If C League can't go, then maybe you have to find. Then you, you have no choice. You have to find a way to to have Lindenberg and Baranowski on the field at the same time. I don't know who you ask to move inside because they're both kind of outside backers. So, But Lindenberg has seen so much football, I'd expect it to be him just because he, he understands the game so well. Uh, but both of them on the field at the same time will probably be the case until C-League uh, is back to himself. Uh, the DBs are getting there. They're, they're, they're struggling with the deep shots. They usually give up two or three each game. But you know what? You hold the team to 12 points. Even a team that's struggling... Just like you said when you prompted the question, that's a win regardless of some 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 ugly plays thrown in there. Yeah, and, and you made a great call. I think we were talking two or three weeks ago um, about Cody and just holding him through the bye week with that hamstring injury. Um, you know, it looks like that was the right call, right? And now he's out there and he's playing and he looks healthy. And as long as he stays that way, you know, the more depth that you have on defense, the better shot that you have. You can return. You know, you could rotate guys in and out. Um, and it gives yourself a shot. So speaking of a shot, the Gophers are right in it, Brock. Uh, let's talk Big Ten West just very quickly. Um, the ESPN last night ran the odds of uh, who who has the opportunity to win the Big Ten West. And I think if I have it correctly, I'm not a math guy, but they, they had it listed as Wisconsin, 34% chance. Iowa, 31% chance. Minnesota, 18% chance. Now, I'm not saying that's Ooh. a crazy number, but hey, that's number three. That's right <laughs> in the mix. Uh, that's one out of five. That's not too bad. So... You know, as it stands right now, you know, where do the Gophers land in all this? Because let's be honest, if we're kind of looking at it, 
Iowa's Iowa's arrow and Wisconsin's arrow has kind of slowly began to slightly tilt down just a little bit, and Minnesota's continues to tilt up. So let's just talk about it here. What do you think the chances are? Do you like the Gophers' chances right now to be into this to the very end? The problem goes back to your Wildcats and <laughs> the overtime loss a couple weeks ago. It hurts. Why that loss was such a big deal is because – Minnesota has Michigan and Ohio State on their schedule this year. They still have to play Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Is it Ohio State some unstoppable force? Of course not. Would you like to currently have a win against Northwestern, be leading the Big Ten West, so that if you fall to Ohio State, you're just tied? Absolutely. Wisconsin has their Ohio State game out of the way. Of course, we saw that uh, just just a few, few days ago. Um, and Iowa doesn't play Michigan or Ohio State this year. Penn State was their big crossover, and, and that was out of the way super early in the season. So that's why the percentage is at 18, even though all their records are currently the same. That Ohio State game is the fork in the road. Uh, really not the fork in the road, the speed bump, I should say. Mm. And you would hate to be in a situation at the end of the year where you look back and say, the Northwestern game did us in, and now we are on the outside looking in of the West. But you know what? Anything can happen, so we will see. But just to explain why their percentage is, is almost half what, what uh, Wisconsin and Iowa is. Well, and, and, am I incorrect, though, that, like, so Iowa plays Northwestern this week at Wrigley Field, and those games have – That's going to be fun I mean, to watch. when we talk about Iowa football and we talk about bloodbaths, um, the Northwestern Wildcats, they get their swim trunks on and they jump in the bloodbath. They have no problem playing those ugly, terrible <laughs> six to three games. So if Northwestern knocks off – uh, Northwestern knocks off Iowa and Minnesota beats Illinois, though. Doesn't that that can also kind of help a little bit? I mean, you got to now stave off Northwestern, but I'm just saying, get another loss for Iowa that could certainly help Minnesota, though, right? One thousand yeah. percent. And if you saw the Wisconsin team that faced Ohio State, you saw okay, Wisconsin's pretty dang good with this freshman quarterback in there. Um, but at the same time, Braylon Allen got injured. So if that Braylon Allen, Allen injury is serious, there is no guarantee Wisconsin's running the table either. So there's a ton left. Also, and maybe the most important thing out of all this, Minnesota still plays Wisconsin at the end of the year. So depending on if Iowa wins out or if Iowa falls again, that Wisconsin-Minnesota game may be the determining factor at the end of the season. Yeah, no, we're just looking at the schedule here just really quick. Uh, you got Iowa at Northwestern. We just talked about that. Wisconsin, Indiana, you would think that they'd be able to eke past that one and probably sure. get the six wins right there. Um, I did hear a little piece of intel that, you know, Tanner Mordecai might not be done for the year. Um, maybe okay. may, may, may make a go of it and try and come back in a couple weeks. But as you mentioned, that running back room, losing Braylon Anchez uh, really, really hurts them because that's their identity. Um, and then obviously Nebraska – Nebraska sneaky is kind of on the uh, their arrow. Talk about an arrow pointing up. They're definitely yes. pointing up right now, and then they get Michigan State too as well. So talk about a little bit of a dark horse right there in the Big Ten West. Um, it's all up for grabs right now. Um, it is in. It's incredibly, incredibly it interesting. Um, before we get out of here, I do want to ask you two things real quick. Uh, real quick, just you know, obviously Minnesota's playing Illinois this week. Um, if you take a look, you know Illinois not quite the defense of seasons past. Um, they're giving a lot up, giving up a lot on the ground right now. They're giving up, I believe, 396 yards total to opposing offenses. Um, so for Minnesota, just real quick, what do you think the key is to just keep it rolling right now? I think this has a little bit more to do with Minnesota than maybe what they need to do against Illinois, if that makes any sense. But what is a quick key to Minnesota? One thousand percent. Quick uh, Minnesota key to picking up a win over Illinois. It's going to come down to the offensive line. I I Illinois is. Even at a higher level than Minnesota, the most unpredictable team right now, which is so opposite of what yeah. Brett Bielema is. Yeah. Like, Brett, Brett Bielema is consistent, if nothing else. E e even in a seven-win se seven win season, you know what you're getting. You're getting downhill, physical football, and you're getting DBs who can flat-out ball. So that hasn't been the case with Illinois. When things are clicking and they're playing penalty-free, they're a tough out. When they're their own worst enemy, they can't get out of their own way. So it's a matter of which Illinois team shows up. But because they're so unpredictable, it's exactly what you just said. It's what Minnesota does. And if they can play mistake-free. If they cannot – if they don't turn the ball over, they'll win the game. Yeah, I feel it comes down to that. Minnesota's defense has found their rhythm. They should be just fine against against Illinois, although Isaiah Williams, their slot receiver, really do it all, guy, not just slot. You see him all over the place. Has been incredible. 
um, in, in regards of, of just how, how often they get him the football and how creatively they get him the football. That being said, Minnesota's defense should be fine if the offense cannot can can play the game without turning the ball over. Clearly, no matter who's at running back, they're going to have success. And Illinois has proven you can run the ball against them. But again, I will say they – cannot turn the ball over if they want to win this game i love it like minnesota go for football 2023 we could have our eighth string running back and we are still going to run it down your throats right like that's such a great mantra and a great philosophy Roll uh, the boat. yeah <laughs> uh before we get out of here really quick just general college football um you know another great weekend in college football um i you know i i'll open up the floor to you clearly like oklahoma losing to kansas is huge. I mean, that turns over the apple cart for sure. Um, what else kind of stuck out to you from the weekend? How fun this year is going to be through this final four or five games. No, I think everyone has four games or, le- or fewer left. I think there's some late bye weeks. But how fun this final month is going to be because – well, five weeks if you include the conference championships. Yeah, The ACC is wide open. I still see Louisville winning that thing. Uh, Fl- Florida State, of course, is the front runner. I love the Louisville versus Florida State matchup, and Florida State is down one of their top wide receivers. Um, so the ACC, all eyes in the ACC, uh, UNC just had a disappointing loss uh, to Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. Louisville just blew out Duke, shut them out actually. Um, so look, look for Florida State and Louisville there. The SEC, Georgia has reestablished themselves as a confirmed number one. I thought Ohio State was going to jump them because of the resume. Um, the official playoff rankings, the first iteration of them, uh, come out Tuesday night. And I don't know if they can put Ohio State above Georgia now, even with the resume, because Georgia looks so dominant, even without Brock Bowers. Um, but Alabama, uh, coming off a of bye, they're coming. starting to figure things out. George, yeah, Georgia's all of Georgia's final games are against teams that are currently ranked. So keep your eye on on the SEC matchup there. Um, Ole Miss, I believe, is just cracked the top ten as well. So they'll they they may have something to say. The Pac-12, man, Washington, despite winning, trending down. Oregon is looking like world beaters right now after that domination over Utah. A Washington Oregon rematch is likely going to determine. Uh, the Pac-12 winner now that USC is firmly out of the conversation. Of course, the Big Ten. We have Ohio State, who put together an impressive performance. We have Michigan, who was resting. Um, a little caveat, will there be a punishment for Michigan that affects this year? A lot of people thought, no way. Now there's brief rumblings that they may get punished this year. Uh I've never seen anything like that, but it's worth noting. Um, so all all eyes on that that Michigan Ohio State game. Now that Penn State again, despite winning, probably not in the Big Ten conversation anymore. And then the Big Twelve, uh, it's looking like a Texas Oklahoma rematch in the Big Twelve championship. Um, but if Kansas has anything to say about it, maybe they'll just keep beating people and uh, hope that Oklahoma or Texas f- f- fumble this thing. Uh, what an awesome year for college football, yeah. man. You don't know what you're going to get. Still impossible to predict what, 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 what four teams are going to have at the end of this thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you've got a team like Notre Dame right now that is honestly kicking the crap out of some teams, but I think uh, they're at 12 right now. They're, they're on the outside looking in. You know what yeah. I mean? So there's going to be some really yeah. strong teams that aren't going to get a sniff at it, and eventually we are going to expand this playoff in years to come. Um, so this is one of those years where we're going to ask, like, oh, what could have been on a couple of different teams? Uh, my other maybe final thought on it, you know, you did mention Washington. I'm just kind of like, I'm sorry, guys. Um, we're on a Minnesota uh, pod, so just hang with me for a second. I was born and raised a Bears <laughs> fan. I was raised a Bears fan, so I have been kind of looking a little bit at some of the quarterbacks coming out. And when you mentioned Washington and Penix, Penix is having a fantastic year, even though they are kind of trending down. The interesting thing that I've noticed, though, too, is well, that I think all eyes this season coming in were on Drake May and Caleb Williams. And you mentioned that North mm-hmm. Carolina game, losing 46 to 42, and then USC barely winning 50 to 49. You know, these are two teams that were ranked into the year with big time quarterbacks. Then, unfortunately, I just kind of think their defenses haven't been able to keep up. And there's just been so many points scored on their end that now all of a sudden they're kind of falling out of the race a little bit. So you just kind of like watching that. I know it's not a part of the, the CFP anymore, but you're just kind of like looking at, man, these yeah. two teams just couldn't hang on, and it's still happening to them too as well. And you saw that with North Carolina this weekend. So um, plenty of storylines, even for teams that aren't ranked, right? And I yeah. think that's what's been so interesting about this. 
it, it, it's been so fun. This Heisman race is going to be interesting because the, the Heisman isn't just who the best player is. It's the story. Yep. Right? It, it's it, it's a story-driven trophy. It's a narrative-driven trophy. And I wouldn't – I I'm a Big Ten guy, but I'm also very aware of the National College Football Conversation. And if this Michigan thing keeps getting worse, it, it will affect J.J., yeah, flat out. And if this is a story driven award, and if I can interrupt, Marvin, no, go, Mar- go, go, Marvin go. got closer, right? Yeah. Marvin got a little bit closer to the conversation. Yes, right? yes, this weekend. yes, yes. So one thousand percent. And um, so, if you look, JJ has JJ has been playing from an efficiency standpoint, the best in the country. Yeah. Not a lot of errors outside of that Bowling Green game. There's not much you can point at to a bad game. There have there been slow games? Yeah. But you can't look at any point of his game and consistently say, here's a weakness week in and week out. That dark cloud looming over them will be enough to affect it. Voters care about stuff like that. They absolutely do. There's so much honor in that trophy. Um, you saw years after Reggie Bush won his, they took it right back, right? So they, they do not want to do that again. They they see that as a dark stain. JJ has to play out of this world from here on out to win that trophy. And even still, they might not vote for him, um, depending on what more information gets released. Marvin Harrison Jr. firmly in the conversation. Bo Nix and Michael Penix, if they have a rematch in the Pac-12, <laughs> it may come down to who looks better in that. Yeah. Um well, really, who looks better coming down the stretch leading up to that game? Caleb Williams is out. The, the the defense let him out. But if I had to pick a dark horse, I would say Marvin Harrison Jr. And we'll do one outside of the Big Ten. I'll say Jordan Travis, the quarterback at Florida State. All of his credit has been given to his two wide receivers who are two NFL-bound guys. Now that he's lost one, if he can still keep cooking, it'll be impossible to ignore if he can get his team to the ACC championship. The best is yet to come, especially in the Big Ten, and also for Minnesota Gopher football because they are 5-3. and three. They're playing Illinois this week. They pick up a win. They become bowl eligible. They're still in it in the Big Ten West. I mean, Brock, man, this is it. This next month, here we go. Here we come. Uh, this was the 4th and Gold Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening right here on Beyond the Big Ten. Follow us at Beyond the Big Ten. I'm Joy Christopoulos, my co-host, my host, former Minnesota Gopher standout, former NFL and CBS Network's very own Brock Vereen joining. Um, Great insight, man. Great perspectives. We'll be back next week to break it all down. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Have a great week, and we will see you soon. 